Welcome everyone. I'm really excited to be doing this. I'm Aurora Light. I am a conscious creation and voice activation coach, and I am here with Jade Izon, who is a client, a friend, and a freaking inspiration to me. She is amazing from hip hop artist to healer <laughs> voice is an activation portal into new dimensions of self-awareness and ascension. So ah, thank you so much for having a conversation with me tonight, Jade. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And also for one hell of an introduction. I super appreciate you. <laughs> oh my goodness. Hmm. So I think, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say thank you everybody for joining in. Mm, yeah, this is gonna be um, something that I think I will wind up doing occasionally because I get to work with the most amazing, interesting, inspiring people who have a lot of codes for potential and creation and possibility in their field. So we're gonna be talking tonight about the comfort zone, that cuddly place that we all want to stay because it's cozy and it's warm and it's nice and safe here. We're going to talk about why it's so hard to leave, why we don't want to, why we sometimes are forced out kicking and screaming, but also about the magic that happens on the other side of it. Jane, you are a living testament to the embodiment of that magic of a place that I like to call the learning zone, right? When we're out of our comfort zone, instead of calling it like the uncomfy zone, which sounds awful, no one wants to be there. When I frame it as the learning zone, which I learned from my belief through patterning mentor, Suze Casey, I was like, oh, the learning zone. I actually like learning. So that, that kind of feels more intriguing. I'm more willing to get out of bed, out of the comfiness to learn and grow. So how do you conceptualize the comfort zone? Well, I mean, that's a really great start to making the places that are uncomfortable a little bit more comfortable for sure. Uh, I love that actually, the learning zone. That's a beautiful, beautiful analogy. Uh, so basically, I mean, the comfort zone to, <laughs> when you break it down, your comfort zone is brought up, raised with you in the environmental circumstances in which you have grown accustomed to. So when you think about your comfort zone, it is literally what you have already, what your mind has already been programmed to know and to understand based off of the circumstances that you've grown up in, the circumstances in which you have been modeled and all of the other aspects of your environmental factors. So this kind of leaves a little bit of room for the comfort zone to be a wildly uncomfortable place. Say if you've grown up comfortable in trauma, if you've grown up comfortable in understanding you know, different forms of abuse or neglect or whatever it might look like. So all of a sudden these places that our mind knows how to navigate and says, okay, we know this, we understand this. We'll go on to feel comfortable in those places and continue perpetuating those cycles subconsciously because they will be comfortable with people and other environments as they grow and shift and change that emulate the same thing that they're accustomed to. So when we talk about our comfort zone and we really break that down, the comfort zone literally is what your mind has already been programmed to navigate and survive due to your environmental circumstances. So now we can kind of see just a little bit of a gateway as to why it might be important to step outside of that space if those things that we're super comfortable with are actually not helping us at all. Mm, just breathe that in because that's key. We wanna stay in our comfort zone because that's what we're used to. But I feel like there are a lot of metaphors that we can use to illustrate what that is like. It's like basically a, a wild animal who say is actually been raised in captivity might be afraid to leave the cage, right? Okay, let's bring this really close to home. My cats, 
<laughs> are, they're, they're wild animals, but they've been domesticated and they haven't spent any time outside. So as soon as they get out there, they're like, right? They're terrified because it's not what they have actually been grow up, like growing up in. And I'm not saying I'm going to throw my cats out there because I actually do want to keep them safe. So maybe it's not the best example, but it is where they would be able to grow and experience more. And maybe I should get my cats a catio so they can be safe and explore the outside. That's perfect. Yeah. And, and I mean, that is really what it comes down to. It's really your mind. It's the place that your mind is most comfortable. Right. And as my teacher, Maria Superior would say, it's about this places that are familiar. Right. So it's about making those things that are unfamiliar, more familiar. So what is it that you want to make familiar? What is it that you'd like to make comfortable? And then doing that consistently and retraining your brain to understand a new environmental circumstance. Mm. And that takes time. And it does take a little bit of discomfort, of course, right? We don't call them growing pains for no reason. They are a little bit uncomfortable, right? But you can make those things more comfortable. And the only reason it's hard is because your mind wants to keep going back to what it knows. It wants to keep going back to those old pathways. It wants to keep going back to the places that it knows inherently that it can survive right? Well, here, I know this, I understand this, I can survive this. But none of us actually want to just survive. And most of us are craving more soulful change and expansion. And that often means doing things that we've never done before, in ways that we've never thought of. And creating that comfort in places that have traditionally been a little more uncomfortable. Mm. So I'm thinking of something and I may not get the name right, but there is a syndrome and it might be Stockholm syndrome when somebody, you know, is really more comfortable with their captors, say they've been actually held in captivity. Is that the totally. one? Um, so yes, it is. Right. Yeah, I think Bell to Beauty and the Beast. Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> because it is what we know. And oftentimes our brain is going, hmm, better the devil that we know than risk something new and our brain is inherently well our brain and our ego are inherently about helping us survive even if suboptimal circumstances if it's something that we have survived in the past our brain is like cool this is safe like we know how to navigate this and new equals potential danger and mm -hmm. and all kinds of things that throw our nervous system into fight or flight and sometimes the panic of thinking that we are going to die when we are trying something new, something outside of the comfort zone. Well, and it's really interesting too, for people who have been traditionally in the fight or flight freeze system, how, um, you know, kindness and compassion and, you know, different things like that can actually trigger that because they're like, what is this? I actually don't know what this feels like. And that becomes something that triggers the fight, flight, freeze system again, because it's super unfamiliar and uncomfortable. And the mind's going, oh, no, 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 this is a trick. People aren't actually like this. So, yeah, I mean, it takes some time, especially for those who are coming out of spaces of trauma, people who are coming out of spaces of survival, scarcity, um, whatever that looks like. And there's a wide range of things like that, right? Um, and even for those who are just, you know, have been comfortable their whole lives, the thought of doing something different and going outside the comfort zone can often still be terrifying. But those obstacles for the general population are usually a lot tougher and based in spaces of scarcity and survival. And really your mind is doing an excellent job. It really is doing an excellent job keeping you alive. And you can be thankful and grateful for that. Thank you, Brain. You've done an amazing job. <laughs> Woohoo! But we want to, you know, live a little bit differently now. And we would like to make some things that are a little bit more comfortable, comfortable for real, over long-term sustainable options. So it's, yeah, the mind is a really tricky, interesting place. And we often fight between the mind and the heart. Our heart will be like, oh yeah, no, no. It's like, go for this. Yay. Yeah. And then the mind's like, you know, uh, excuse my language, but back the fuck up. That is not the place you go. And when that happens too, you send out an incoherent signal 
right? So you're sending out this really scattered sort of incoherent signal and your mind and your heart aren't aligning, your body is freaking out and you don't like, no, nothing really feels really safe in that. And this is where we get lack of clarity and where we can't make a choice from one hand or the other and everything just kind of feels a little bit scattered. Nothing will stick all of these other spaces. So when we can retrain the brain to align with our heart's desire, then we can send out that coherent frequency and actually begin to, you know, mass the energy around us to begin creating a foundation for a life that you're empowered to want to be in and live. And that's incredibly important because if these two spaces are not in alignment, the amount of energy you're actually wasting in terms of your existence and how you can create that existence is profound. And the more you start taking that back and the more you start aligning those two spaces, the more you'll realize how much energy you've actually been giving to, um, fighting yourself really <laughs> yeah and sometimes it's beyond just the brain and the heart not being on coherence uh we can also throw sometimes the subconscious mind is fighting against what your conscious mind is wanting to do and that's where things get really frustrating because you're like okay my heart wants to do this and the soul wants to do this and my conscious mind is going yes let's do the thing but the subconscious mind may be running those survival programs and they're the ones that are going, eek, no, stop. And then it can come up in forms of self-sabotage or fight and flight, fear, things that are gonna shut down what you want. And you're like, why can't I do the thing? For sure. And actually one of the most common themes I see in this uh, self-sabotage of the subconscious coming up for a lot of people is actually procrastination um, and procrastination on the things that they really want to do. And because they're so or too busy doing all the other things that they think they need to be doing. So that's kind of one of the little funny things. But the subconscious mind, you know, once you start to realize that your mind is working for you and you get to sort of tell it what to do, it changes the whole game, right? And once you start learning how to constructively talk to yourself in ways that reprogram the mind, you'll start to notice that balance out, but it does take consistency. The subconscious mind will listen to what you tell it. And this is why words really matter, right? Words really matter. So if you're telling yourself, oh, I'm stressed out, this thing is killing me. Oh my gosh, I'm so tired all the time. Oh my gosh, you know, like my kids are just constantly exhausting. And you know, they might be, don't get me wrong. I mean, as mothers, we know kids can be exhausting, but <laughs> um, our mind listens to these things, right? So say like our job, we don't really like our job. Our job is killing us. It's stressing us out. We hate it. Oh my gosh, you know, Sharon is always a bitch to me all the time and I just hate going to work. Well, our body, our mind, our subconscious mind goes, oh, well, this is terrible. This is killing you. I don't want you to die. So I'm going to do whatever I need to do to make sure you don't die. And then all of a sudden you're getting a cold or a flu or you're not, you're feeling too fatigued or something's happened with this overwhelm. It dumps your body with a whole bunch of cortisol and adrenaline and you're too you know, you're not unable to go to work anymore. And then your mind's like, look, I did a great job. I kept us safe from the thing that you said was killing you. And in turn, I'm like actually kind of killing you. <laughs> so it's really interesting. You have to be very tricky because the way you speak to yourself, a thousand percent matters. Negative self-talk and telling ourselves and using words with those resonance actually do lead to depression and they do lead to anxiety and they do lead to going down to those rabbit holes, Mar. When you can change the way that you talk to yourself, most of the time I understand that there are real things out there and exceptions, so I will not minimize or devalue that. But I will say that learning to change the way that you speak to yourself will inherently start to reprogram those old patterns that were picked up in the subconscious to begin with. And I do believe that if you can heal the subconscious and you can heal the way that you speak to yourself from there, you can heal from the root up and you can heal pretty much just about anything. Read that in. I know from personal experience, honestly, that was the thing that allowed me to step into everything that I'm doing and creating now, my magic, being able to manifest, being able to create two dream businesses that shared my gifts and do all kinds of things. It was learning to speak to myself more like how I would share my love with everybody else. I'm sure most of us have had this experience before of 
like being super nice and kind to literally everybody in your life until it gets to you. And then you berate yourself and you would say things to yourself that you would never say to another human being, even if you were trolling anonymously on the internet. Like how mean have you been to yourself for things that are pretty inconsequential, right? And being able to shift that inner voice allows us to come into coherence with who we actually are as well, right? We get to be the kind, compassionate, loving, coach, person, friend, mother, wife, whatever you are to ourselves. And in the belief repatterning that I do, we call that turning your inner critic into a coach. And it's basically giving yourself permission to take your own fabulous advice with everything that you do. Learning to trust yourself really is an art and it takes a lot of time because we have most of us been disconnected from ourselves. We've been disconnected from our true power and from trusting ourselves. We've been taught not to trust our intuition, not to really actually, you know, go within and listen to what our body's wisdom is telling us. And that's incredibly important, especially when your body's wisdom has been corrupted, but from the nervous system up being fried with life circumstances and environmental factors. So it is incredibly important and that inner critic, as you call it, um, you know, it shines in all sorts of different weird ways and it will really do its best to keep you small. But when you understand that that really is just your mind actually trying to keep you safe from any type of repeat of future pain and harm, it's, you know, it's a good sign that your, your surviving mechanisms are really, really in working order, but maybe not aligning with what you actually want to be in your full embodied expression, right? Of what you want to create with your life and be inside of your life. And that self-talk matters so much in terms of getting out of your comfort zone. Because when we change the way we speak to ourselves, we feel empowered to create change. We feel resilient to withstand the flux and the ebbs and flows of life, right? We feel empowered not to undermine our capacity for creating our life. So getting outside your comfort zone really actually means recreating what that comfort zone looks like. Those things that are comfortable now, you can make uncomfortable. You can say, no, this is actually not comfortable. This is not where I want to be. I want to be over here. And then you can start taking action with the way you speak to yourself and how you're gonna choose to take action into creating that and making that real. And that takes a little bit of time and that's okay. You know, everything's a process, but it's an important one, especially if you want to connect with your true happiness. Mm -hmm. Not only is it a process, but I find it's literally a practice, which is awesome though, because when you're practicing something, you don't have to be good at it right away. You're allowed to fail. You're allowed to screw it up. But if you give yourself permission to practice doing this, if you catch yourself, great. It's an opportunity just to rewind what you've just said to your own self and then try it on. And then as you're doing that, you're creating these new pathways in your brain. And they're very much like roads that are full of snow and ice. And we're talking about repatterning, rewiring, changing your neural pathways you can think of it as that icy road that has these ruts and those ruts are the paths that your thoughts travel down. And if you've driven in the snow, you know, it's easier to drive in the ruts. So if we want to create a new pathway so we can go somewhere else from survival into those thought patterns that will help us thrive, it does take effort, right? To like get out of the ruts and start a new path. But the more you practice, the more you drive along that path, the deeper they get and the more comfortable it becomes. And it's actually taking you to the destination where you want to go. So it is something you can practice and it, it takes a bit of time, but it doesn't have to take as long as we might think, because there are this plethora of amazing tools that exist to actually help us hack the subconscious mind to work for us. So I've mentioned belief repatterning a few times. That's something I use in my practices in, with my clients and with my groups and all my programs. But you have a whole bunch of other tools that you use as well, Jade. And we kind of skipped over the really introducing you part. 
So I have two things I want to talk about. Number one is I do want you to share some of these tools that you use now and some maybe quick and simple things that people can try on. But I just want you to take us back first to tell a little bit about your story, about why this is important to you, how you've personally experienced it, and what that has done to shift your life. Like, bring us back. You're speaking from personal experience, aren't you? Absolutely. I mean, the reality is, is that everything that I stepped into and learned about in terms of my certifications and my credentials were completely inspired by experience and having and gaining natural wisdom of having to repattern my own brain from the ground up. Um, I came from a background of a lot of trauma and, you know, I don't mean just one or two things. I mean, sexual, I mean, physical, mental, emotional, there was a whole plethora of it. I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder by the time I was eight years old. It was documented that I had uh, expressed suicidal tendencies at that age. <laughs> I was diagnosed with manic depressive disorder and also had um, a severe panic disorder that would leave me in full-blown hyperventilating panic attacks um, at least a few times a day. So uh, sleep was not really a thing for me as well. Uh, I struggled very much so. Uh, I did not fit in with other kids. There was a huge disconnection from my, my social capacity um, in really being able to relate and play. Um, yeah, I mean, really, it came down to just having this experience. And this, and this went on, right? I moved out very in my early teens. Um, or mid-teens, I should say, I moved out um, and decided to make a go of it on my own uh, due to my family circumstances at the time. I love my family and I'm in a beautiful alignment with my family, but, uh, you know, we all learn from these things. So, you know, there were aspects that were very unsupportive in terms of allowing me to handle my mental health. We, my parents come from a gener generation where mental health was very much swept under the rug and um, it was helped very, very strategically in the medical world where things were just medicated and uh, therapy was very, very sort of one dimensional. So that was really, you know, not supportive for myself and my growing journey and really just found me in spaces where I kept perpetuating the image of, of, of brokenness and shame and damage. Um, there was also a hint and big elements of secrecy. Oh, you were sexually abused. You don't, don't tell anybody about that. Don't tell anybody. People will look at you different. They will view you differently. And the interesting thing is, is what perpetuates that shame is that in many cases it is true because we haven't had these uncomfortable conversations and brought them to the light in more comfortable ways up until recent years. So this was my journey in terms of going from the broken to brave area. And uh, these sort of things kind of went into my relationships later on. I decided to choose relationships and that, that uh, perpetuated the abuse, for example, you know? So <laughs> you get kind of sucked into spaces where people are takers and your environment really matches in one way or another, even if it's different and even if it has joy or comfort in it it still continues to um, match what's going on uh, from the previous circumstances. Uh, yeah, so it took me quite a long time to um, sort of, uh, <laughs> my daughter is sort of getting up there, uh, but we're good. Um, it took me a long time to repattern these places. It took me a long time of learning and growing. It took me, you know, picking up books on my own and reading about psychology. It took me going and doing research and trying to learn to understand the brain better, learn to understand the body better so I could actually hack what was going on because I just didn't settle for being told that I would be that way forever. I was like, no, this is not, this is not me. This can't keep happening to me. It felt very violent, you know? <laughs> it's like, this is not who I am. This just is something that just continually happens. And that's really what it was. It was these symptomatic circumstances that were rising in my body over and over and over again and disconnecting me from my power and my potential and all the things that I wanted to be. So I really just didn't settle for that. And I refused to do that. And uh, I was already a book nerd, you know, lonely isolation does that to you. So <laughs> I read a lot of books. I learned a lot of things about how my body and my brain actually works because I don't teach you that in school. And I decided to dive into unconventional dynamics 
and try some unconventional things. And eventually, with consistency, I rip myself apart and put myself back together over and over and over again. You know, and I will say that I was fortunate for the resiliency in change. Change was something that I was quite comfortable with, where not a lot of people have been afforded, and I do call it a luxury. So I, <laughs> I was very, very comfortable with big and wild changes. And I can say that from that space to where I am right now, there is no way that if you met me even 10 years ago, you would see even remotely the same person. Not even remotely, you know, maybe sparks, but nothing close to what I am now. But this is who I always was underneath. All of those things that kept me down and told me I was worthless or not good enough and told me that I was insecure, unlovable, all of those different things. You know, I put myself down so much and then constantly filled this love in other people because I felt like that was my only value or worth to others was to make others feel good. So it took me a long time to be able to extend that back into myself, to learn more about what was happening, learn more about the chemistry and start hacking that. And that's what I've done now from that experience and then from going now to back to school and getting my certifications i've weaved in and created programs that are meant and based off of this experience to help you cultivate your resiliency based off of your circumstances so you can understand you're not your stories you're just reliving the symptomatic feelings of trauma that are associated with them and then you can turn that weight from your shoulders stick it underneath your feet as a foundation and learn to use that as your wisdom rather than it being the creation of your entire world because we're just replaying those feelings, recycling those feelings. They don't actually exist in the world that you're in in the present moment anymore. So when you give yourself that permission, you can kind of go and explore. So that was, you know, pieces of my story <laughs> summed up. <laughs> And it, it's really inspiring because I didn't know you then. I've known you for, oh gosh, I mean, probably only about a, a year and a half, actually. But there has been so much that I've witnessed you create in your life. Like you put your mind to something, you set an intention to do something, and then you're like, bing, bang, boom, it's done. And even better than I expected. So this is a testament to the power of this rebuilding process that, I mean, hats off to you because you did it yourself. And then you got the validation and the confirmation from the training programs and you pulled in some of those skills. But you, you really have this lived and embodied experience and wisdom that you're able to share with people. And you also hold in your field what the possibilities are like on the other side. So tell us a little bit about what it is that you have created and are creating in your life right now, both for yourself and for all the people that I know you're um, going to be supporting, your clients, all of these amazing programs that are being birthed right now through you. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I do want to just take a second to also say that as much as um, I have like I did a lot of that work in terms of learning and expanding and growing and getting that validation um, through uh, my certifications and things like that later on in life, that uh, there have been some really beautiful people along the way and that have held space and witnessed me and helped me grow. And without that connectivity, I absolutely would, you know, like there's no way that I would have been able to, I'm not, you know, like a robot. I can't, nobody can do that alone, <laughs> which is why it's really important to be able to um, be in a space to be witnessed and reach out for help. I, uh, I had a life coach whose name was Jane Willoughby. She was a psychiatric nurse for 30 years and we got brought together and she was really foundational in those spaces when I was really starting to recognize my survival and the awareness of what was happening inside that space and then shift. And now, you know, I have you as a coach as well, which has helped me in the thriving zone and helped me in the creation zone and helped me in the playing zone. Now that I've shifted those foundations and I'm out of that fight, flight, freeze response, it's given me a lot more permission to play. And in that time that we work together, having that creation, having that container to be witnessed in this particular way and to shift through some of those like you know little bits that just like to you know hang on have 
has been incredibly powerful and very helpful in terms of me stepping into that and stepping in and feeling empowered enough to say, you know what, I do have the wisdom, I do have the skills, and I want to share that with people because I think everybody deserves to feel love for themselves. They deserve to feel connected to their power and they deserve to know that that is divinely their right, that they were born confident and they have an absolute divine right to step back into that with integrity, truth, and full expression. Everybody has a unique gift to give this world. It might not be the same as what, you know, being in service in the same way in the same industry that you and I are, but I truly believe that everybody has something unique to give. And it's just about recognizing what that is. And you can't do that unless you get back to yourself. And I say get back to yourself because you already know who you are. You just, you know, maybe don't recognize how to pull all those pieces in together yet. So stepping into what I'm creating right now is I have a program called Art of Empowerment, ART standing for Aligned Resilience Training. And this bridges the gap between science and spirit and really allows a multidimensional healing system from the ground up, healing your nervous system all the way up through into the root. And it is great. It's for, you know, those who are really who have done a lot of work and they're ready. They're ready to take those next stages and collecting all of the fragments of the work they've done and pulling it back in into their full remembering. Now, for those who are a little bit earlier on in their journey, I am uh, co-creating some things in the shadow work and self-love realm and sacred self-care and really getting into more intensive work with my business partner, Ryan Snow from the Center for Wholeness and Wellness. And we will have some online offerings as well as they offer a private coaching as well. So uh, if you're looking for transformational journeys, those things will be available soon. Or if you're looking for personal coaching, you can reach out to either person. Mm. And I just need to bring this into your personal journey since you mentioned that we have been working together. So we've been working together since January, February. And at that time, all of these things were really dreams. Like they were seeds. They were things that you knew that you wanted to create these programs and you had them in some form or another, but there were things holding you back. Can you speak into maybe a bit of how you felt just like flashing back to back then, how you felt about this mission that you knew you had and, and like why you felt like you wanted to work with me and get support in that? Like what was holding you back? Yeah, certainly. So uh, as you so kindly mentioned earlier, I was in the hip hop industry. I was a professional hip hop artist for uh, quite a few years. And, um, you know, the music industry, beautiful, but also has a specific environment. And uh, I chose hip hop. So degrading women was a hundred thousand percent, you know, uh, <laughs> a real thing, uh, you know, and uh to be quite honest, I kind of find it funny in terms of the experiences that I had with trauma before. Of course, I would end up in the hip hop scene if I was going to be in any music scene. Uh, yeah, so I was in the hip hop industry and also I didn't have really good, clear energetic boundaries with myself, energetic boundaries um, in terms of how I was giving and receiving and quite flat. I just did not know how to give to myself and was in the same boat as many people. And I felt guilty about any type of self-care. I wasn't present in it. I never refilled my cup. I was always, you know, that those worth wounds really just played out, you know? Uh, so my worth and my value was always stemmed in hiding behind uh, the talent, you know, and, and just, you know, giving and giving and giving and giving and giving and giving and giving. And I had also always been a very spiritual kid in terms of connecting with things on the other side, connecting into vibration, seeing things, feeling things. And, uh, you know, that just really added a lot to the whole I'm weird factor and that label that I really, you know, and I don't, <laughs> I am, and I really love that. But <laughs> at the time, I did not love that I was that weird. And I spent a lot of time really trying to disconnect from my intuition, disconnect from any of those things, and really shove myself even further into, you know, the systematic uh, acceptable stigmas of what I felt like I needed to be as best as I could be it in that state of sort of brokenness, just so to speak. Um, so when I disconnected, 
uh, out of that. It was a really ugly kicking and screaming, like you said, kind of thing. I knew I didn't want to do music anymore, not in the same way. And that was a really hard thing for me because that was what I really wrapped my whole identity around at that point. And that was what I was hiding behind for a long time. And I was visible and constantly visible, right? Thousands of views, had a record deal offer, all the different things. And it really weighed on me because I felt like I was always succumbing to the pressure of what everyone else wanted all of the time. Do this, be that. Well, you have to sound like this. You have to sound like that. You have to be. And it just ate me. And I had no good, clear boundaries. So I broke down, moved to the trees, reconnected with myself moved out of those spaces <laughs> and spirit just kept knocking. I was like, Hey, so you have other things to do here. You have other things to do. And I remember wanting to leave the hip hop scene and they're like, take a hypnotherapy course. And I was like, oh, hip hop to hypnotherapy. You're joking. And by the way, I graduate as a rapid transformational therapist and hypnotherapist in September. So it's fine. It's all fine. We're doing things. Um, and what really guided me to come and work with you was, um, in terms of the reconnection with my spirituality, reconnection with having those visions, reconnection with, um, spirit on all of those levels, you know, channeling visions, you name it. I was like, okay, you know what? It's time to listen, but I need a container where I can be witnessed and validated in the next spaces of this expansion. So coming to you was really about going, I'm afraid to be seen for who I really am. You know, a very weird, spiritual, interesting, talkative human being. And that was really difficult for me to feel like a lot of the visibility wounds from being in the hip hop industry really were eating me. So having and getting that permission to shift through a lot of those limiting beliefs and reprogram and rewire using a different tactics than I've been able to extend myself. You know, I can't do everything yourself. It was a beautiful mirror for me to be able to see that magic and step into that a little bit further and embody all of the places that I already know I am. So thanks for that, by the way. My pleasure. Actually, can we tell the story about how we actually wound up working together? Yeah, I'd love that. It was it was super magical. So um, I have group programs and the playground membership and all kinds of things. And I'm really focusing on building these groups. And I closed down taking one on one clients for a while. I like energetically wasn't available to that. And so I didn't even have a lot of people coming to me going like, hey, can we work one-on-one? -on -one? And then it came to a point in December where I was like, okay, I feel like I'm ready. I can open that up again. And universe, bring me some soulmate clients. Like I am so excited to meet whoever it's going to be. And I typed up a post on Facebook and I hit send. And at the maybe like one minute later or at the very same time, I can't remember, you messaged me and you were like, hey, can we look at what working together might look like? I was like, did you read my post? No, no, what post? And I just started laughing hysterically because it was the energetic gateway that I opened and it pinged to you and you were just like, hey, it is time. And it's funny too, because I was thinking about working with you for a little while and, um, you know, I'd been kind of just tossing back and forth, tossing back and forth. And I knew you had mentioned a while back that your, your roster was full and I was like, oh, okay, whatever. And, uh, and then it was just, I remember like I was, I was actually, uh, in the passenger seat of, um, my vehicle and uh, driving and, uh, I was like, oh, you know, fuck it. I'm just going to message her and just put it out there and see. And I was like, ah, maybe, maybe, me, you know, sent you the little message. That was exactly what I said, by the way, me, 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 me. And uh, <laughs> sent you a message and you're like, you, well, yeah, you know what? Sure. Yeah. This is what just happened. And you sent me your post and I remember reading it and just laughing and I was like, okay, spirit. All right. Yeah, this is it. And 
for me and it's it's it, those, those things are not just coincidence it's like you know my friend nina calls them winks from the universe and i love that you know and uh they, that's exactly what they are and i found that the more i reconnected with my own power the more i reconnected with my own space and as we've continued this journey the more those things have just opened up synchronicities beautiful beautiful synchronicities that just keep playing and playing out and playing out and unwinding and unfolding in new beautiful layers and i just i really truly want that for everyone everyone yeah. everybody deserves to feel that expansive joy and love in their heart mm. and that is what happens when you rewire your brain out of survival out of those old programs and into the remembrance of who you actually are as an infinite creator being here to grow, play, explore, exchange your codes, you know, share your gifts and have some freaking fun with it. Then totally. the magic happens. That's what happens when you move outside of that comfort zone and you spend some time practicing and you're doing it intentionally and with full consciousness and awareness and open to, you know, the synchronicities right? Without that expectation of how it needs to happen. And I think that's what I've really just so enjoyed witnessing over these six months is we will set some intentions. You'll set them. I hold space in this beautiful sacred container. And then you're like, you know, that really big thing that I said I was going to do, bam, here it is done. Like it's <laughs> yeah. <sure. laughs> The amount of synchronicities, opportunities, collaborations, co-creations that have flowed to you over the last six months, and especially over the last three months, have been blowing my mind. It oh. has been absolutely wild. Oh, hi. Um, yeah, it has been absolutely wild. And and you know, like speaking into the experience and stuff outside of the like outside of the wisdom that I have I know how hard it can be to step outside of your comfort zone I know how uncomfortable it feels I know what it feels like to be uncomfortable inside your own body and your own skin and what I can say is that that is why I created these programs and why I'm continuing to co-create new programs to get you back in touch with your body's wisdom. You deserve to know how your body works and how your brain works on a very basic scientific level. And you also deserve to know how to pack those spaces for your highest alignment. So these things that we've created are fast track. So you don't have to spend, you know, 90% of your life <laughs> trying to learn these things to step outside your comfort zone, right? And just remembering that your comfort zone often can be really uncomfortable. Your environment has changed. You have changed. And the only reason you're feeling so uncomfortable in those places of your comfort zone is because your spirit knows that that is actually not where you're comfortable anymore. So allowing yourself to energetically step into the presence of a brand new environment and step into yourself into more alignment you will be giving yourself a gift instead of robbing yourself of the time. You deserve to feel empowered. Just breathe that in. <laughs> you deserve to feel empowered. Mm. And I know you've got an incredible toolkit for people and you have whole courses and you work with people one-on-one -on -one and there's self-study programs coming, but what's something somebody could actually put into practice now? to begin this process or to supersize it if they're already on their journey. Yeah, so I would a thousand percent tell you to write a letter to yourself. Write a letter of all the things that you wanna step into, all the things that you want to feel like in that space and just watch what transforms over a week of you reading yourself that letter out loud saying it out loud and actually feeling the experiences that you've felt already you know say you really want to step into confidence and clarity writing that down you know i'm learning to be more confident or i am confident and feeling that in your body right and that was one, I believe that's even a hack that I am learning. That is something that, you know, that's a little hack right there from belief repatterning as well as neuro-linguistic programming. And 
I love that so many of the things, you know, with neurolinguistic programming, it is, it's just burning in new pathways. And also remembering that these things aren't like, they're not positive affirmations. You are systematically learning to talk to yourself in a different way and in the way that you deserve to be spoken to, right? So it's not a positive affirmation. You're not just giving yourself some empty, you know, I'm awesome mantra here. I want you to systematically re you actually want to embody and be. If you hear yourself talking negatively, don't cut it off. Say, thank you, I hear you. You're trying to keep me safe, but this is actually what I want to feel. And this is actually what I want to be. Of course, you know, honoring yourself is really important in that. But I would say taking time out for yourself to care for yourself in a way that is consistent. So the sacred self-care, just 10 minutes a day, steal it away. If you're not, if you've never stolen any time for yourself, 10 minutes a day, steal it away for yourself, okay? Pull it away for yourself in just 10 minutes, 10 connected breaths, it'll change your life. <laughs> and talk to yourself nicer for one week. Just challenge yourself for one week to talk to yourself a little bit nicer. Mm. And you will feel a lot better. That's amazing. Three really actionable steps. And the reason I was laughing so hard is that 10 minutes was suggested to me when my daughter was, I want to say maybe like two and a half. I was running my business. My hun husband was um, sick at the time and he was off work or he had just gone back to work. And I was used to being in that mode of like giving, giving, serving, doing all the things. And I scoffed. I laughed and I made all kinds of excuses why I could not possibly give myself 10 minutes, especially at the start of the day. I'm a mom, I have a business, oh my God. So many lies were pouring out of my mouth that I actually believed because that had become my comfort zone, doing all of the things all of the time. And it wasn't in the past before I had a kid, before I had these experiences of a, a business and you know a husband who was ill that I was, um, that, you know, taking, not taking care of, but being the, the person in the family in charge of all of the things. I was good at self-care in my late teens or late twenties, right? I could take a whole week for me, but things shifted and things changed. And sometimes when our life gets more complicated, we have more responsibilities. We have kids, we have businesses, we have relationships. We've got maybe parents or other family we're taking care of. We need to reprogram from where we are you know, in these spaces, because we mm -hmm. think that things have changed and we need to create new pathways, new programs, new patterns of caring for ourselves as we care for others, especially when there's greater complexity, right? And now I am the biggest advocate of, yeah, don't take just 10 minutes, like go for 15, maybe even half a day, right? But it's completely. A it is a process. And also that speaks into the thing for lifestyle overhauls too, right? When we're stepping out of our, you know, our comfort zone, it's okay to, you know, bite things off and honor them, you know, one, one step at a time, you know, full lifestyle overhauls work for some people, but many people that doesn't actually work for it. It really is hard to stick. And then we perpetuate again, those cycles of guilt and shame because we feel bad that we weren't able to do it all at once. Um, it takes energy, right? And it's not bad or, you know, like it's not bad energy, but it does take energy to rewrite new pathways. So, you know, remind, being reminded that the self-care is actually really important. That 10 or 15 minutes a day is going to make all the difference in recharging your battery and also showing up for yourself in ways that are going to help you feel good and, and, and to shift into those spaces, right? So when we take that time for the self-care to recharge our battery and fill our cup, even though all these amazing, beautiful things may be happening, it's still important to just for a second, let it all integrate. Even if it's big, amazing, beautiful energy, the self-care doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. Otherwise the overwhelm goes crazy. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. So <laughs> it does not stop. It doesn't get to stop. You have to honor that consistently, whether the energy is good or not. And that's how you'll learn to really trust yourself 
and also to integrate the energy, whether it's good or bad. You're developing a healthy practice for yourself that shows you that you matter because you do matter. Yeah. I love how that it needs to happen regardless, whether things are going well, things are going poorly. I liken it to doing the dishes or doing the laundry. It's not a one and done task. You don't just get to take care of yourself that one time you went to the spa and it was great. And let's just really briefly talk into sometimes self-care looks like doing things that are not bubble baths and chocolate. Sometimes it is doing the shadow work. Sometimes it is reprogramming your brain or having difficult conversations or reaching out for support. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think- I mean, truthful. Go ahead. Sorry. It, no, it cut out there. Continue. Mm. I don't know where I was going. Oh yeah, we don't have to do it alone. That's the thing. Some people have walked this path ahead of you. And so having a guide, having a mentor can make the path open up for you. It's like basically following a snowplow because while you're going to need to integrate the information and practice it and try it for yourself, you don't necessarily have to make a bunch of mistakes or figure it out on your own. And that's why it's so beautiful to find a mentor like Jade, like myself, like anyone who resonates with you, who can take you there faster by holding space and saying, here are some tools, here are tips and techniques, here's what works for me, but also mostly let's try some things on and practice without feeling like we're not getting anywhere because how great is it to have someone to reflect to you how far you've come? We almost never look back at that either. Unless- Oh my gosh. Right? So when I'm saying six months ago, when you came to me, what, what was holding you back? I bet that feels like a totally different person now. Oh yeah. A thousand percent. I'm like, it's, it's so funny. Cause like looking back, I'm like, what was I tripping about? Jesus. <laughs> oh my gosh. Like, man, did I like to make things hard for myself because I believe that everything had to be a fight. So with myself, first and foremost, everything has to be a fight. I've been fighting my whole life. So you know what? My swords are out and I'm going to just ninja and fight everything right so and like and that just that's the way that it is right and we do that we totally do that and you know being fair generationally speaking this world really has been in like a scarcity fight mindset we come from that as like a collective never mind our individual paths so as we shift out of that scarcity mindset as a collective and in our individual paths it's you know it's a real programming societally and individually <laughs> Mm hmm. Oh my gosh. So much. So, and that's the thing we want to give ourselves a lot of grace and compassion because we are programmed, not just by our experiences, but by the collective experiences by your family lineage. Like it comes through epigenetically. If your family has been in survival in fight or flight in famine, like you will have that imprinted on your body, but totally. doesn't mean that you can't shift it and make dramatic dramatic changes in as little as six months, three months, less than that, because you are breaking through to so much magic right now. And I just want to speak into getting really meta. You know, one of those things for you has been visibility, even though you had been this, you know, hip hop star icon, at least in like the smaller areas that we are in, right? You were used to being visible like that as the character you were playing, but coming exactly out, that coming out into the authenticity, right. And being visible as the wholeness of who you are has been a process, right. Of repatterning and getting comfortable. A thousand percent. And I felt even in those spaces where, you know, I had a lot of people speaking to the hip hop thing. Like, oh, you're so confident, you know, look at you. You're so fierce. And I was like, no, <laughs> I get off stage and I go home and I cry because I have absolutely no idea. Like the amount of like 
you know, shame or uh, hardship that I would put on myself. Did I do it good enough? Was I presenting good enough? Was I, did I take enough time with that person who was expressing how, you know, uh, impacted they were by my music? Did I give them enough attention? Did, you know, and it was just like energetically, I just would crash, right? And it was, uh, yeah, I mean, you're playing it, you're playing an avatar. It was a, it was a way for me to uh, express myself outside of the wild discomfort I was feeling in terms of who I was, which was, at the time was actually a like wildly insecure person with a lot of worth issues. So those, you know, as soon as I took that skin off, that all came flooding back in, right? Which is why reconnection and you know, uh, integration of all the different aspects of ourself as a whole integrated being is so wildly important. Avatars and role, you know, playing or, you know, role playing is, is also really healthy and amazing, expressive thing. But it's also, you know, something that we have to learn to integrate with more ease and grace. And we still have to do the work in terms of what those spaces look like and how we can integrate them into wholeness for sure. Mm -hmm. But that is the thing. The last thing I want to leave everybody with is the power of coming into that authentic self in all of its imperfections, right? It's perfect, divinely perfect in the imperfections. People would rather see a whole you or at least the people that actually matter, that resonate with you and not the character that you're playing, not that avatar that you are being. When you show up as all of you, which you have been doing over the last while, the opportunities are magnetized to you, the clients, the people that want to support you in your mission, all of those opportunities are like, oh, there you are. We can finally feel you and see you. you're using your voice. And so we can hear you. We can, we have found you. And so I just want to um, invite anybody that's watching this that knows that they have this mission to support the earth, to support the people on it, whether you're at the part of the journey where you're doing the healing or you're stepping out more fully into your mission, the authenticity might be outside of your comfort zone for now, but it is where the magic happens. <laughs> and I will also say for those of you who are afraid to be seen and express yourself, regardless of where you're going and where you're headed, the one thing that I can say outside of magnetizing opportunities or magnetizing, um, you know, clients or whatever it might be that you're on for your mission, when you show up authentically as yourself, and when you show up and you are allowing yourself to be visible for all of you, you are giving other people the opportunity to love you as a whole being rather than the fragments of the pieces that you're presenting which in turn will also take care of a lot of those self-doubt and self-worth things. Because as you show up you know, authentically, people will love you. The right people will love you authentically. And when you don't do that, you rob yourself and others of the opportunity to love you as the whole imperfect being that you really are, whether that's in transition or not. So getting outside of your comfort zone, expressing yourself fully as you are, and giving yourself the opportunity to see how beautiful you are and how worthy you are of love. And not robbing yourself or others the opportunity for loving you in your highest expression of yourself. Mm, just breathing that in as well. And my daughter just came in to remind us of the medicine and the authenticity that kids bring forward, right? before they've been programmed with the like put on the masks and not be us and we love children more than anybody like i mean most of us or at least your own children but children as a whole because they're just so authentically them and genuine so part of this process is getting back to who we were then authentically but pairing it with the wisdom of all of the lessons that we have learned right and that's again where all that magic happens. And I do need to get this one to bed pretty quick, even though it's a Friday night and because of where we live, it is still bright out and good times <laughs> harder <laughs> around the solstice in, in Alberta. Let's just share how people can connect with your magic, Jade. It is rootandreboot.com. Is that the best place to find you? 
Yeah, you can find me there. You can feel free to add me on Facebook, Jade Eisen, or you can connect with me on Instagram, which also Jade underscore Eisen. And that's J-A-I-D-E, last name I-Z-O-N. So rootandreboot.com, or you can just feel free to reach out to me in person. Amazing. So we, we work together with each other, we co-create, but we're also sharing so many of the same things, Jade. That's what I love about working with you. The programs um, that we're doing create in, in different ways, but the same results. And it just makes me so happy to know that you and other people are, are doing this work too, of supporting people and coming back home to themselves, healing all that trauma, transforming the limiting beliefs, connecting with that highest self experience and allowing it to be an embodied expression of that essence. And uh, I just love you so much. So thank you so much for joining me tonight. We're going to put into the comments or into um, the links there where you can connect with Jade. And if you have questions for her, just pop them in the comments if you're watching the replay and uh, we'll get back to you. But this has been a lot of fun. There have been so many hearts, lots of people um, sharing a lot of love, especially when you were sharing your journey and story. So. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. We appreciate that. Thank you for having me, Aurora. Mm, so welcome. Have a beautiful night, everyone, or whenever it is for you. And um, we're just wishing you a lot of love and we will see you soon.